You are listening to an episode of Common Humanity Podcast. The guest today is the co-founder of Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, college professor from Oxford, Mississippi, and world-renowned ACT trainer, Kelly Wilson. Your host is psychologist and theologian Dr. Lonesko from Denmark. Today's podcast dwells upon the question, what if nothing needs to be removed? What if your own hardest thoughts and feelings need not be the enemy? Enjoy the podcast. Welcome to this podcast show. It's a conversation with Kelly Wilson and me, Dora Lunosko. I'm a clinical psychologist in Denmark. I'm so happy to welcome you. Kelly Wilson. Glad to be here. Yeah. So I'm in Copenhagen and it's dark outside. Well, it's winter. And where are you at at the moment, Kelly? I am uh, in Oxford, Mississippi, and uh, it's uh, sunny and uh, warm. And and it's winter here too, but our winters don't uh, aren't like yours. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So I'll let you introduce yourself uh, in a little while, maybe give us a professional bio. But before you do that, I'd like to give a more personal introduction. I met Kelly in Copenhagen when he held a workshop for psychologists. And ever since I've had a mantra, professional and private. Actually, I stole it right from uh, Kelly's slide and uh, from his behavior. It's this question what if nothing needs to be removed it's a question that i linger in every time i find myself struggling because could it really be so what if nothing needs to be removed i find myself at that workshop and still uh, with this um, wish to share this with everybody with my friends with my clients actually with everybody so that's why i'm very happy to Welcome you, uh, Kelly, at this uh, episode. And, uh, thank you for taking your time to be with us today. Uh, I know you are a busy man, uh, traveling around the world, teaching acceptance and commitment therapy, being a researcher, being a yoga geek, if I can call you that, <laughs> <laughs> a husband, you, uh, you a dad. And why don't you give us an introduction to whatever of Kelly Wilson you'd like to share with us? As a start, and you know, actually, um, I get introduced frequently by other people who sort of read these long bios, and yeah, I always, I always get this funny feeling like they're talking about someone else. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so now you have the opportunity to talk about you. <laughs> well, uh, let's see. I'm a, I am a, um, a very fortunate um, person who. Uh, came to formal education uh, rather late at the age of about 30. Mm -hmm. And I had the very good fortune of encountering some people who saw in me uh, possibilities that I could not see in myself. And um, I had some a series of uh, truly outstanding teachers and mentors uh, at my Uh, undergraduate institution and in my graduate training who uh, helped to cultivate me as a, a teacher and a therapist uh, and as a person and who ultimately uh, landed me in a, a very unlikely spot. So my history up to the age of 30 was a history of uh, a really devastating uh, depression and substance abuse uh, addiction. And uh, in uh, 1985, when this sort of different stream of events uh, began, um, I uh, could not possibly have imagined uh, finding myself, you know, here uh, nearly 30 years later, uh, a college professor and uh and a, a lecturer and a teacher and a therapist uh, father uh, so my current position i'm i'm a, a professor at the university of mississippi uh, and uh, they are uh, kind enough to allow me to uh, 
travel around the planet. Um, uh, sometimes uh, I uh, 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 joke with people that uh, my job is traveling around the world, falling in love with people. <laughs> and uh, it's um, yeah, my training is uh, 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 deeply in uh, behavior theory and philosophy and in uh, clinical psychology. I hesitate to say that sometimes because people have these ideas of uh, what behavioral psychologists are, and most of them are not very positive. Something like uh, ideas. rats or something. <laughs> yeah, something with rats or or uh, or uh, clockwork orange or something uh, strange like that. Uh, I'm a behavior. I'm a behaviorist uh, who's interested in a robust science of human liberation. Uh, that that. Whoa. Um, I won't. I, I won't claim that that is um, something I have accomplished. Um, it's uh, aspirational. I am interested in the development of a robust science that can help people uh, be freed up in their lives to live the sort of lives that they uh, would choose. That's me. I I I teach it. I research it, and uh, I try to uh, train uh, people. Uh, to teach and research it, mm -hmm. you know, these kinds of things. And I'm becoming increasingly interested over time in uh, ways to reach out to a broader audience uh, than I have been able to uh, in my role um, teaching graduate students and uh, teaching therapists. So I'm, I was very glad to uh, do this podcast mm -hmm. with you today. Well, maybe maybe uh, a good place for us to start would be with that uh, mantra you mentioned. Yeah. Sure. Uh, which is, um, what if nothing needs to be removed? Yeah. And uh, I have a slide that I use very often when I'm uh, teaching. And I spend some time with people sort of settling in and making contact with uh, things about, you know, that. Uh, you know, when people look inside um, and sort of ask themselves questions, you know, like, am I good enough? Am I smart enough? Am I strong enough? Uh, am I kind enough? Is my English good enough? <laughs> Is my English good enough? <laughs> they ask themselves these questions and uh, they're quite often uh, met with uh, ambiguity you know, with the uncertainty. And, you know, they quite often and quite naturally uh, tend to assume that, um, you know, there's some insufficiency there, that there's something about them that there's too much of or too little of, uh, something uh, in them that needs to be removed in order for them to really move ahead Uh, in their lives. Now, usually people don't talk about this. So they don't say, you know, hi, my name's Kelly and I'm fundamentally unlovable. Uh, or, you know, I'm not a very uh, nice person. I know I seem to be a pretty nice person, but really you know, hear my thoughts and know my heart uh, in my uh, darkest uh, hours. Uh, you wouldn't think so highly of me. Um, what what people um, I think don't know is that um, that uh, sort of very fundamental sense of um, self doubt, um, wondering about our own sort of worthiness and uh, goodness, um, is uh, part and parcel of the human condition. That that if you're sort of alive, awake, and looking within at all, um, that, you know, this is the kind of thing that um, uh, people encounter. They look around in the world, and what they see is happy, smiling, <laughs> you know, people who look strong enough and smart enough and good enough. And, uh, and what they, uh, what people very often conclude Uh, is that, um, you know, they're in some fundamental ways um, 
not functioning as well as others. Um, there's a saying where we talk about people sometimes comparing uh, other people's outsides uh, with our own insides. Yeah, that's true. And we look at other people's outsides and they look great. You know, they look strong and smart. And, and uh, and you know, we look inside and, and you know, we find uh, uh, doubts. You know, like, for example, um, I've been doing workshop trainings for... Uh, quite a few years now, I don't know, 20 years. And uh, I think uh, I, I have never done a workshop that lasted more than a day where I didn't have a time in the midst of that when I just thought, oh my goodness, this time I've just gotten in over my head. You know, <laughs> so? every, everyone in the room is going to see it. You know, they're going to see that um, how, how far short. Um, uh, that I'm going to fall. They're going to see uh, that I do not have, I do not possess what I promised, um, that I won't serve them. Um, and I, you know, have these moments of just extraordinary, uh, you know, uh, doubt. And, you know, there was a time, you know, 20 years ago when I, you know, had the idea that you know, maybe after I'd done a dozen or two dozen workshops that that would just go away. Uh, but I'm at a point where I've done more than 200 workshops. And, you know, I, I still know uh, that that sense. Now, I tell people about it. They very often don't believe it. They exactly. Say, <laughs> what? Yeah, they, as they've seen me get up, you know, sometimes dozens of times in front of large rooms full of you know, room, rooms full of people. And they assume that the only way you can do that is to feel confident. Mm -hmm. I'm here to tell you that um, uh, feeling confident in my world uh, is a little like the weather, you know, it kind of comes and goes. Yes. Some days the weather's good, some days the weather's not good. Um, what I have learned to do and what I try to teach people to do um, is uh, to come out and play on the days when the weather's good and to come out and play on the days when the weather isn't good. Um, and that's what people are seeing is I've learned um, uh, to play when I'm strong and I've learned to play when I'm weak. Um, my mind does not get a vote in that. <laughs> you know, and there's so there's that kind of fundamental question, you know, is, you know, what if, you know, my mind tells me that there's some insufficiency in me. And there's that question, you know, what if it's just not so? You know, what if there's nothing that needs to be removed? What if right here in this moment I possess uh, everything I need uh, to live the life that's before me, which includes having this conversation with you, teaching my next class, seeing my next client, um, you know, going out and joining my family after I finish talking with you. And at the same time, I can hear a but. Of course. Yeah. I mean, my mind. What about, what about, and what about these depressing feelings? They have to be removed before I can go out and enjoy and do this and that. And it's so easy for you to say, and all these buts. Sure. Sure. I have those also. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and And, uh, I, and when people come to me and they say, oh, gee, you know, I, I, I want to get rid of all these butts that sort of show up. Yeah. Um, also the butts I, we need to, we need to get rid of. Well, you know, one of, uh, you know, one of the things we used to talk about acceptance and commitment therapy as a, a, a therapy that's, uh, uh, interested in getting people off their butts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, You know, uh, when people ask me, you know, how do I get rid of all of these doubts or these buts? I tell them, you know, I, I don't know how to do that. I, I, I don't I, I don't know how to get rid of my own. And I and and I wouldn't presume to tell you that I know how to get rid of yours. But but what I do know and what I can teach is people to have to not have those doubts be in charge of their life. So uh, I haven't figured out any way to successfully eliminate them, but I have figured out a way to not have doubts be in charge of my life. Mm -hmm. in, in fact, if you really want to never have any doubts, you know, just 
keep doing the same thing over and over again. You know, find something that you know how to do and then just keep doing it over and over and over again and never do anything hard, you know. Doubts will creep in, you know, that the, you'll, you'll doubt whether that's the best strategy. <laughs> <laughs> do best, you know. And, and it's not a bad thing. I mean, it's, it's it, you know, we evolved out on the savanna. And, you know, if you sort of looked around out on the savanna and said, is it safe? Is it safe? You know, can I, can I venture out? Um, you know, if you kind of imagine that maybe there were some early hominids, you know, some early humans who didn't worry too much about whether it was safe or not. Mm-hmm. And then some who, who, you know, really were very vigilant about that. You know, those ones that weren't too worried about being safe, um, they were just a little free and easy, a few too many days. And there was the day that, you know, that bush over there actually was a lion, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a bush. It was a bush with a lion right behind it. And the careful ones, you know, they survived, you know, the careful ones survived and the careless ones got eaten. And, you know, we're the offspring of the offspring of the offspring of the careful ones. Mm-hmm. So what you're saying, we should actually be thankful for our mind capacity as um, under some circumstances the ability to be really careful um, is really help but many of the circumstances where being really careful is really helpful are really not present anymore we've kind of killed off all the lions tigers and bears for the most part you know there are still dangerous places to wander around in the world But most of the places where we wander around, you know, there just aren't any lions, tigers or bears to eat us. Um, The kinds of things that, you know, we're afraid of are, you know, sort of looking bad, being wrong, being embarrassed, um, having people see us fall short of, you know, some standard or another. Not things that you die from. (laughs) So we kind of move the savanna inside of us or something we carry it around or absolutely we you know um we moved we moved the savanna inside that's exactly right you know when we were out on the savanna and you looked out and what you saw was sort of ambiguous you know you're not sure is it a bush is it a bear cautiousness was a very very good uh, thing under those uh, circumstances you know when you look inside and start asking these kind of questions inside you know am i good enough am i smart enough am i kind enough and you meet ambiguity that same uh, sort of doubt and caution uh, comes in to play the difference is is that you know when the thing that was dangerous was lions tigers and bears well you just stayed in when there were lions tigers and bears out there and if there were too many of them in the area you lived in you moved to a different area mm-hmm. or you figured out to trap them or uh you know hunt them down or something like that but what do you do when the thing you're afraid of is something inside of you some quality where can you go to be safe uh, from that mm-hmm. that ends up being a trap for people you know they Um, have doubts about themselves, and then they live according to the rules that those doubts lay down. You know, if you lived according to the, uh, you know, you have a doubt uh, about the quality of your uh, English. Mm -hmm. Um, We're in charge of your life. Would we be talking on on Skype right now? No, definitely not. (laughs) You wouldn't even have asked me. No have this conversation if that doubt was in charge if that doubt it would say um Mm -hmm. it would probably say things to you like let me just give this a try you know uh let me just guess um oh he's way too busy he uh he won't talk to me uh my english isn't very good and i'll just uh you know sound stupid when i uh, smart enough he's a professor (laughs) 
and, and all of these kinds of things, if you lived according to all of those uh, sorts of thoughts, and, and I know you also had to be pretty persistent to get me on a Skype call. Exactly, yeah. You know, I'm a crazy, busy guy, and I get lots of people request lots of things from me. And if people aren't pretty persistent, you know, sometimes when I'm on the road, you know, I'm getting 100, 150 emails a day. It's easy for me to have an email get lost or a Facebook message get lost. Mm-hmm. Uh, if people just sort of, you know, ask me something, then they don't and I don't respond. And then I know on the other side of that, they're thinking, oh, you know, he doesn't want to talk to me, but he doesn't want to be mean to me and just say no or something like that. Um, <laughs> and I, I bet you your mind talked to you oh, yeah. about whether you should reach out to me again or not. And now that's not any different than. You know, people are walking around in the world right now. There are people who are listening to this and they're thinking, oh, I want to try to get that other job. That looks like a much better job than the job I have right now. And then their mind will start talking to them and they'll say, oh, there's a lot of people more qualified than you. Um, You know, maybe this isn't a good year to do that. Maybe you should keep on this job for another year. And next year, maybe you'll be more prepared to do that or... Uh, you know, and on and on. Or you know, maybe there's somebody at work that they would like to ask out on a date, you know, and they think, oh, she seems nice. I'd like to ask her out. And then they think, well, no, she's she's way too attractive for somebody like me. I'm kind of a lump, you know. Uh, I'm not that interesting. I wouldn't know what to say. Um, I, I, You know, I saw the way she kind of glanced at me at lunch the other day. I I don't think she really likes me. Uh, um, maybe I'll ask her next week. <laughs> um, live, you know, the bottom line ends up being lives unlived. You know, people living smaller lives than they need to live uh, because what is in charge of their life is those doubts. You know, they lose choice by living according Uh, to those conversations about limitations that sort of float around between their ears and often think that there's something wrong with them, you know, for that. They don't know that that same conversation is floating around between the ears of every human being on the planet. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It's a well-kept secret. Yeah. Well, sometimes I'll, I'll uh, ask people and say, you know, imagine if, you know, you know, everybody on the world sort of, wrote on a card what was wrong with them, you know, like um, deep down, you know, what they think is wrong with them. And imagine we made a deal where everybody at the same time laid their card down. And yeah, just right at the same moment. And you looked around and you saw that everyone had the same thing written on their card. You know, what would that mean to you you know if you saw that now i know um, people uh, don't you know probably the people listening think well you don't not like mine mm-hmm. they wouldn't have it's just in my cut wouldn't think that um uh, but i tell you what i have seen a lot of cards a lot of cards yeah thousands and thousands and uh you know they really just don't look that different. I mean, sometimes they're like, I'm not smart enough. And sometimes they're not, I'm not, you know, kind enough. Um, but they're all some version of, you know, there's something wrong with me. You know, there's something just not quite right. Sometimes people don't have a name for it. Just a sense that there is something wrong. And, you know, I like to ask that question. You know, what if everyone has a secret? And it's the same secret. Mm -hmm. There's a guy who I really like. Um, His name is Sebastian uh, Moore. Uh, He's a a Catholic theologian. I'm not Catholic uh, myself or anything, but I I like uh, what he says. And, And here's what he says. He says, the rejection of our common fate makes us strangers to each other. The rejection of our common fate 
makes us strangers to each other. And, and to sort of unpack that, what he means is that I look inside and I find these doubts and this kind of sense of this flawed me. And then I look out at the world and I think, oh no, if they find out how flawed I am, you know, they're going to reject me. You know, they, they won't let me stick around. So I better try to look like somebody who is okay. And so I start doing my dance, whatever my dance is. Be smart, be funny, be nice, you know, be helpful, um, be scary, you know, be something, you know, that keeps you safe. You know, what I don't recognize is, is that other people are looking at me, um, acting smart and acting funny. And they're thinking, if only I were that smart and that funny, you know, and, and, you know, what if they see, you know, how not smart and how not funny I am. And so, you know, and then, so then what you do is you start looking like somebody who deserves to be here, you know, somebody who's smart enough and funny enough. What ends up happening is, is, you know, both of us in that rejection of that common fate um, have become strangers to one another. You know, I don't get to know that you, just like me, uh, carry doubts and uh, sorrows um, and joys, you know, all together. The second part of that, so the first part is the rejection of our common fate makes us strangers to each other. Second part of it is the election of that fate in love reveals us as one body. You know, and it means that I can take my own um, sense of frailty, of uh, weakness, and um, I can offer that to people. I can speak out loud about it. Um, and the effect that that has had over the years is that... Um, People like you um, hear me talk about my own weakness and, uh, and get the idea, well, maybe there's room for me too. Exactly. Weakness and all. You know, most people learn how to play out of their strong game. You know, they learn, they learn to play when they're strong. Mm-hmm. You know, they never learn to play out of their weakness, only out of their strength. And what that means is on your strong days, you get to play. And on your weak days, you have to either stay home or lie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and what most people never learn is how to play out of their strength and play out of their weakness. If you can learn to play out of your weakness, then it means you get to play every day, every single day. Um, and it means that you can give other people permission. Uh, to play not just on their strong days, um, but also on their weak days. I offer my strength to people, um, but I also offer them my uh, weakness. And probably the reason that I've uh, been as successful as I have been has been, well, it is much attributable to my uh, willingness to offer my uh, uh, weakness. Mm-hmm. And that leads me to another thing that is, what if our suffering... I think you said something about what if our suffering or our struggles can be a treasure? See, that's that's just it. Is um, you know, you take um, that that sort of sense of you know frailty. Let me put it this way: very few, uh, not that many people, can um, really connect with me, um, feel a kinship with my strengths, right? They listen to me do theory. You know, I'm really good at doing theory, you know. Hold forth. I am professor. <laughs> it's hard for people uh, to connect on on that. You know, they, they see it. You know, some of them are, tr- are, are um, trained so that they can um, understand, understand it. Mm-hmm. But... You know, for the most part, you know, people's kind of response to that is sort of like, wow, you know, that's that's just something, you know. Um, you know, some people are, you know, have the and I, I don't think this is because I'm like incredibly smart or anything like that. I'm, well, I'm really well trained. I mean, I'm adequately a smart guy, but I'm very well trained. People have invested 
a lot of time in me. Um, and so there are other people that are well trained in the same way. And, you know, you know, we can kind of go toe to toe on that. But most people have not spent the enormous amount of time that I've spent on, you know, learning behavior theory, how to design it and how to apply it. So, you know, it's only natural that most people are not going to be able to play in that same league. I mean, I could go watch, you know, the musicians in the orchestra and I'm just going to, wow, I could never do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. But I put in you know, 10,000 hours of practice. You know, uh, you know, uh, so of course I can. So, you know, when we have these, these strengths and everybody has, you know, different strengths in different areas, when we have these strengths, it's very often hard for people to connect with us around those strengths. They sort of are like, you know, wow, that's something. But, but one of the things that, that we all have, that we all share is we have. We so that's why we can connect. That's good news. <laughs> yes. It's around. Our sense of frailty, um, our sense of weakness, our sense of sadness, you know, that is something that we all share. And it lets people know that I'm with them, you know, that, that um, I hear them, that, you know, we're in, we're in this together. Um, if I could wish my weakness away, you know, so that it never crossed my mind again, mm -hmm. Uh, that it never rose up right in the middle of a workshop, <laughs> you know, and felt like it was just going to carry me away. Um, I wouldn't wish it away. You know, if I have to choose between uh, carrying it and being able to connect with people or not carrying it and not being able to connect, I'll carry it. You know, I'll carry it. it it's worth the wait. <laughs> well. And, you know, people need to ask themselves that, you know, kind of question, you know, it, you know, what if whatever it is that, you know, I'm thinking is wrong with me, you know, you know, what if it, you know, what if it doesn't need to be sort of extracted, you know, what if it isn't, you know, some kind of terrible infection, what if it's just part of the human condition, you know, uh, to have that sense of self-doubt. Mm -hmm. So I have days where, where I'm not sure it's worth the wait. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course I have. Yeah, absolutely. Some days feel flat as a pancake. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a couple of pieces to this. I know sometimes people hear this and they think, oh, my goodness, that's depressing. You know, I don't want that. You know, or they'll look at the thing about themselves that they don't like. and you know, they'll sort of count the cost to that. Mm -hmm. Very often, though, I think, you know, what my experience has been with people is that the cost has really not been so much with the thing about them that they think is a problem, but really with how they managed, you know, what they thought was wrong with them. You know, so, you know, very often when, you know, it's people's struggle is what they think is wrong with them that causes them the biggest uh, difficulties. You know, I mean, uh, take the examples, you know, the kinds of examples that we see uh, very commonly in the world of, um, kind of mental health treatment, things like anxiety. Well, does anxiety cause people problems? If you watch anxiety sort of rise up, what do people do when they get anxious? And if you look... You know, one of the things that you find people do is they find ways to manage their anxiety. Sometimes uh, they'll manage their anxiety, you know, by taking uh, drugs and they feel less anxious. But the problem very often with the drugs is that it also kind of they kind of disconnect people sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes people drink to manage anxiety and, and you see the same thing where it does sort of bring anxiety down a little bit for a little while but it ends up disconnecting people. Um, sometimes the way people manage their anxiety, say if they're anxious about interacting with people, is that they avoid uh, people, you know, avoid interactions. Or when they do have interactions, they really kind of constrain their interactions with people. You know, and what happens is that relationships 
suffer as a result of that. You know, and then the person sort of goes away and they're like, oh, you know, see how I am. You know, my you know, relationships are like terrible. Well, are they terrible because you were anxious or are they terrible uh, because you had anxiety plus this struggle with them? myself? The one I had to contend with, I'm not really the anxious sort myself. Um, uh, sometimes I, I, uh, I tell people I'm more the moody, depressive yeah, sort. I remember that. <laughs> You know, yeah, when I was uh, 30, um, I was hospitalized for a month in a locked psychiatric ward. And I had been suicidally depressed since I was an adolescent, I suppose. Uh, I mean, I think if I like think back on it, you know, when I first remember thinking uh, about suicide, I was probably... 13 years old, something like that. And by the time I was 15 or 16, that was a real live option. You know, it was something I thought about a lot. I thought about ending. And, um, you know, by the time I was uh, 30 and, you know, was locked away in a psychiatric hospital, you know, I could just sort of look back over that period of time. And I had this story about myself. And the story was something like this. The story was, you know, there's something kind of fundamentally broken about you. Uh, There's something fundamentally destructive about you. And the closer people get to you, the more damage they will take. And it would be better for you and better for everyone who knows you, uh, for you to be gone. And that's... That's what I uh, believed. That's what I thought. And um, these are not pleasant thoughts to live with. (laughs) And uh, I could uh, to make them go away. You know, I tried to drink them away. I tried to drug them away. I tried to suppress them. Um, I tried to pretend them away. And um, the harder I fought, the stronger they got. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I got to the age of 30. I could not fight anymore. I had no fight left in me. And, you know, if, you know, you would have asked me, you know, at the time, you know, what is causing all this problem uh, for you? I would have pointed to that sort of depression and that kind of fundamental sense of brokenness. In 1985, at the age of 30, um, I, I couldn't fight anymore. And I had this choice. And the choice was... Um, you know, would I stay or would I go? And it, re- it was, um, you know, if I was going to stay, um, I couldn't fight anymore. Mm-hmm. If it was going to be about fighting, I had to, I had to leave. And uh, so I made this deal with the universe in 1985. I can even tell you the day it was June the first, 1985. I made this deal with the universe, and the deal was. Um, okay, I'm going to stay, um, and um, I'm going to eat everything that's on my plate. You know, <laughs> kind of the way my mom taught: clean my plate. You know, so if what's on my plate today is uh, sadness, if what's on my plate today is um, this kind of uh, feeling of hopelessness, then I will clean my plate today, and I will say thank you. But part of the deal was also that if I was going to stay, it was going to have to be for something. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I let go of uh, fighting that day, um, fighting with my insides, fighting with the thoughts that I had, fighting uh, with uh, the sadness that I carried. And um, I started to, you know, wonder you know, what I might do with my head, my hands, my heart, you know, if I weren't spending every moment of every day fighting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and there were, there were things that, that kind of came in there and, and um, you know, helped me to entertain that. You know, that question, you know, what if nothing needs to be removed? You know, it came out of, it came out of you know, those days, you know, those days in, in 1985 when I made that deal to stick around. 
there, there's a guy, Joseph Campbell, very cool guy. He's uh, written about mythology, you know, human religions, spiritual traditions and myths. And uh, one of the things he talked about was uh, the hero's journey. And he talked about follow your bliss. And I was watching, it was like a public television program, you know, and I started thinking, hmm. And Joseph Campbell, he wasn't talking about like Hercules or something when he met the heroes. He meant like every single human being on the planet. Not only had a, It was everyone. Every single human being on the planet had a hero's journey to make. And I started thinking, what would mine be? You know, because heroes' journeys, they're all, they always involve incredible hardship, you know, like you just think, wow, you know, it's, and I started thinking like, what would, you know, what would mine be? You know, one, like, what would I, what would I bear? What hardships would I bear? You know, what would I be journeying towards? And, and I didn't know, but it seemed like, yeah, you know, and, and then that other idea that follow your bliss, that was a trip. <laughs> I'm thinking like, what? You know, and he, he clearly didn't mean like, you know, uh, there's a 60s thing. If it feels good, do it. You know, he wasn't talking about hedonism. Mm -hmm. You know, when he, when he said, follow your bliss, he didn't mean, you know, if it feels good, do it. I mean, there were lots of things that I knew that felt good. You know, heroin felt good. That's not what he meant. You know, he meant um, something deeper, like uh, coming from your own heart, like a sense of... Um, direction you know a sense of uh, purpose and i and again i didn't know what it was yeah that's what i'm wondering did you start your journey without knowing towards what i had no idea so you just started <laughs> out or no all i had was you stopped or what did you i mean i all i had was what you know what what would that be what what you know what might that be you know just this deep wondering what might that be for me like i mean what my head had to say was there's nothing there's you and the void you know that's, you know that's how my head works is mm -hmm. no sorry it's just you and the void and and but it, what it was was like what if i'm just wrong about that what if there is you know some purpose that's my life up until that day had uniquely prepared me for You know, what if there's something that I could do with my own life that, you know, could make a difference? This question isn't just for me, it's for you. I mean, this question, I'm offering this question, you know, like, you know, like what if, you know, there is something that your own life, everything that's happened, I don't mean just the good things that made you stronger and smarter. And I don't mean those. I mean, everything, all the things that made you, you know, stronger and smarter but all the things that hurt you like if all of those things together what if they have prepared you uh, to do some kinds of things that um you know are uniquely available for you to do you know and we know this is true you know um like i had cancer in 1998 mm -hmm. head neck real scary um it wasn't clear whether i would live or not And I've uh, been a consultant on a couple of cancer grants. And when I consult on these grants, I'll very often go interview people, people with the sort of difficulties that are going to be in the study. And I can like sit down with somebody who's like had cancer and like, I'm just like, yeah, got it. Right. Now, I wouldn't recommend anybody go get cancer, mm -hmm. you know, you know, so that they could hear. You know, I already paid the, you know, ticket. You know, I mean, I already paid. I already had it. So if you already have it, you know, what does that hardship afford me? And so it was that that kind of willingness to sort of inhabit that question. And then this kind of very slow, steady practice, you know, that brought me uh, to this uh, day. You know, like one, like, I mean, it was really simple stuff. like. I didn't have any education. I was 30 years old and I dropped out of high school. So I didn't have any education. And I thought, well, I probably will need some education to do something that makes a difference. I had this little job paying like $4 an hour. And um, so I took a class at the community college, just one class. You know, I kind of got in there and I, 
and I applied myself. You know, I read and I paid attention and I sat in the front of the class and I like I thought, well, if you're going to get an education, then you should do what a good student would do. And I sat in front of the class. I took notes. I asked questions. I studied. I applied myself. And you know what? It was really, really fun. <laughs> you know, in the next semester, I took one more class, you know, and I did the same thing. And it was sort of like, oh, this is good, you know. And then I started thinking, well, but what specifically am I going to do? And I'd taken this psychology class. And so I went and talked to the professor. So I was thinking, well, maybe I'll do something in psychology. There were about three different kinds of paths that I could see in front of me. There were sort of something in psychology. Because I thought maybe I could be helpful, useful. And one was this kind of two-year program so I could be a drug counselor. I had never really finished anything, you know, like I didn't finish high school. So I didn't really trust myself to finish anything. But I thought maybe I could finish this two-year thing, maybe. And then the other thing was like a four-year degree, which would make it so that I could be like a tech, uh, technical person in a psychiatric entry level. Mm -hmm. And then the last degree option would prepare me wouldn't prepare me to do anything except to go to school some more. <laughs> and, I know that one. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're in that long loop. <laughs> this professor, and I say, I say to him, I say, okay, so I've got these three different things. And he asked me this question, and it was a transformational question. I mean, it really was. He says to me, he says, well, what do you want? You know? I mean, I was just, I almost fell out of my chair, you know. I was, I was kind of like, wait a minute. Is what you're saying that I should think about what I really want and then use that to decide what to do? And I mean, it was like, you know, like, really, you know, like, because I had not been making decisions. The, I, my decision process was sort of like, okay, what do you think you can get away with given this long list of limitations you know, what do you think people will let you do? You know, what do you think you're like smart enough to do? But it wasn't sort of like, what do you want? I mean, that was just not the basis of it. I mean, I, I remember going home and talking to my mom, you know, I said, mom. So then he says, what do you want? Hey, man, it was like a new world, you know, and I thought about it and I thought, like in a world where I could choose, um, I would want to make the biggest difference I could. You know, I'd want to be able to reach out you know, to the limits of my um, ability to reach and not knowing what that was. And so I took that third path with a head full of doubts. <laughs> I mean, I dropped out of high school, you know, and I'm thinking about something that's going to lead to a PhD that, you know, if you, if you do it in a really timely way, something that's going to take a, a decade. In fact, uh, not a decade, but more like a maybe 13 years. <laughs> but it turns out that, you know, my head told me I would never finish. My head told me that I wasn't smart enough to do it. My head told me I was not steady enough to do it, dependable enough to do it. And you know what? My head was wrong. It was just wrong. You proved it wrong. And now, that's not the path for everyone, but my job is to wonder with people like, what would your journey look like? Where do you want to take your life if you got to invent it, you know, be the author of it? See that? Oh, I like that question. See, they can't see, you know, the people listening to this, they're just listening. But see, they we're on Skype and I'm looking at her face right now. And I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking, but you can't see what my mind is telling me. But I, but I can look in your face. I can look in your eyes and I think, Ooh, I wonder what that journey would look like for her. Mm -hmm. I hope she takes it. I hope I live long enough to see where it takes her. I hope she stays in touch and lets me know. Sure, I will. I and, mind telling me that. Well, that's Kelly. And it, <laughs> and it works for Kelly, and I, I can see that. But you should just know what I carry, my struggles. I mean, I need to get rid of that first, and then I'll let you know. <laughs> Welcome to the the, the uh, human club. Thank you. Uh
You know, I, and I, I have that same, same thing. I mean, I'm looking a couple of years from now, I'm going to take a sabbatical, about a year and a half. I'm going to take a sabbatical. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have this idea of kind of rebooting my career, you know, just sort of like deciding what to, you know, I'm 58 years old. And uh, so I'm like old enough to like know that I won't live forever. But, you know, like I know I've got a portion, you know, and, and to take a year off and really think, what do I want to do? What do I want to do with this next part? And to just spend a year hanging out inside that question. And of course, you know, what my mind has to say is keep doing what you're doing. You know, you already know how to do this and it's secure. But uh, I didn't stay alive certitude. I stayed alive for possibilities. And, you know, what it has turned into is not just possibilities for me, but possibilities for everyone I talk to. I want to know what's possible for them. You know, I mean, nothing would please me more than like somebody hearing this and thinking, huh, what's possible for me? And that that started in motion, you know, some kind of transformation. I know that that happens. I mean, I know it in my own life. I mean, I spent the 1970s, you know, injecting drugs, you know, arms and uh, committing crimes on a daily uh, basis. I mean, I was a, a truly uh, destructive force in this world. It wasn't just a story about being destructive. What I didn't know then that I do know now is that that was not inevitable, you know, that it could change. I didn't know that it could change. <laughs> and I just like wonder about like every ear that finds itself listening to this and the human being connected to it and what's possible for them. That is my heart's desire. See, people don't mostly like live their lives inside of conversations about limitations. I'm, I'm just not interested in those kind of conversations. I'm interested in conversations, um, you know, out of possibilities. You know, how to, how to create that kind of conversation, how to sustain it, how to spread it around. So I wonder, Kelly, as you speak, I kind of connect to a lot of sadness. Mm -hmm. Like all the struggle, all the struggle, all the sadness. Sure. The dark night. Mm -hmm. yeah. This yes. feeling of hopelessness and loneliness. And, yeah. Well, I, you know, I stopped having it be an enemy. You know, I, I learned to let go of the struggle with it. And what I found was, uh, you know, I mean, think of it this way. Like, there are a lot of people who feel that sense of loneliness and isolation. And, you know, I know that I've seen people, you know, that I've encountered people. And um, there's this kind of funny thing that happens is, is that they find out they're not the only one. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a funny thing. To, and then you start smiling. <laughs> you know, I'm so lonely. You know, and then you find out you're not the only one. And, and so, you know, and it's not like a kind of a misery club or anything. I mean, my life is not miserable. I mean, it, it's not. I mean, I have really excruciating moments and uh, my life is is extraordinarily rich and just filled with things that I never, never would have thought possible. It's one of the great uh, ironies of all of this is that, you know, when I fought against the difficult things I had inside, I created a path of destruction in my life. And for both the people who are around me and for myself. And when I stopped fighting it, all kinds of things became, you know, my own education became possible. A husband and a father became possible. My ability to be a teacher became possible. You know, my ability to be a therapist became possible. You know, that thing that, you know, seemed to be my source of suffering, you know, somehow or other, when I kind of took my hands off of that, I was able to put my, you know, hands on uh, building a life. And so acceptance for me made it uh, possible for me to have this kind of rich and extraordinary life that I have ended up happening, having and, and have allowed me to be uh, useful in a lot of people's lives. And that was what I always, you know, I You know, I think back then when I wondered where that journey might take me, it was like to be 
useful. In this. You know, there's a Sanskrit word. I'll probably mispronounce it. So it's not like there's anybody who's out there speaking Sanskrit who's going to get mad or anything. Yeah. Concept in yoga sometimes. And you know, I'm all like wild. I love yoga. So concept is ahimsa. And, you know, my understanding of it. And again, I'm, I'm not a scholar uh, in this area or anything is something like um, non-harming, uh, non-violence. And the way that they use it in yoga is that, you know, when you practice yoga, which can be, you know, physically very, very vigorous, there's a thing that you can do in the middle, like some postures, uh, for example, you know, like chair pose where you're sort of partially crouched down, your legs are, are, uh, folded part way, and your arms are uh, lifted in the air. And if you sort of maintain that chair pose, sort of looks like as if you're sitting in a chair, but there's no actual. Your thighs start tough. Uh, they'll start. I think it's about time to end this pose now. <laughs> you know, there's a couple of different things that that you can do. Uh, you know, you can just not do the pose. You know, that doesn't do too much, at least not on an immediate basis sort of force yourself to do it, you know, kind of grit your teeth or something like that. But there's this other kind of thing that you can do is, you know, to do the posture, even some of the ones that, you know, are challenging that way with kindness, uh, to practice this idea where you sort of find that place, you know, right in the middle there that is not sort of not doing the posture, which there's no kindness in that because my yoga practice helps me, you know, it helps me to care for my body. So there's no kindness in not doing the posture. There's also no kindness in sort of forcing, you know, this kind of violence, you know, that we can do. And so it's one of the things that I do when I'm uh, practicing yoga is um, I'll just stop. Um, they'll sometimes talk about finding the rest middle of each pose like and some of the poses don't look like resting poses no, not even a little bit <laughs> something like this idea like finding the rest inside of the pose and you know so i'll stop in the middle of a pose and i'll ask myself you know am i practicing this concept this ahimsa this non-harming non-violence in this moment um are there places where i'm holding tension that's not necessary for the posture am i forcing myself you know to do this or am I offering this posture to myself? And that, to me, is a good question, not just in yoga, but, you know, in life. You know, we find ourselves in these situations. You know, you were going to call me about this interview, and you wouldn't have been doing yourself any kindness to just decide in advance that it was a bad idea and not to do it. That wouldn't have been a kindness. Mm-hmm. You know, the other thing is that you could sort of force your way sort of through it where you're spending, you know, kind of gritting your teeth, you know, but there's this other thing you could, can you just offer it to yourself, you know, spend time with me, make that call, you know, be persistent, not in a violent way, you know, but in a way that carries that sort of quality. It's a good question to ask, you know, in relationships, in in your work, you know, in your interactions with people, even the little interactions like the person who takes your order at the restaurant. Mm -hmm. What would Ahimsa look like there? You know, when you check out at the grocery store, you know, what would it look like there driving to work? (laughs) Mm -hmm. But still, it seems like, at least to me, it's it's much easier to practice with other people than with myself. Yeah, boy, that is sure true. It's much, it's it's much easier to be kind to others. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have a client I was talking to some time back. We were having a conversation that had to do with some work this person wanted uh, to do, needed to do, had promised to do. This client is a writer and had promised to do some reviews. I can't remember if they were book reviews or uh, reviews of articles, but they were going to do some reviews that would um, be published and potentially, you know, critical Mm -hmm. of the work being reviewed. And they had 
put it off for a very long time. So in this conversation, I asked her, I said, and, and you know, when I asked, you know, well, what's the obstruction? You know, it was, of course, all these kind of doubts, like, you know, do I really have something important to say, you know, or what if I end up saying something and then it, I'm missing something really obvious, you know, and everybody, you know, looks at it and they're like, geez, you wasn't, you know, how did you miss that? You know, and, and all these kind of doubts and everything. And so I asked her this question. I said, I asked her, you know, and so she couldn't even get started writing it. You know, she was just kind of jammed up even getting started writing it. And I asked, imagine that the only people who were going to see it and read it were people who really loved you. Mm. What it is that you were trying to do in writing the review. You know, like there's a lot of reasons people could do reviews. You can do a review so that you look smart and, Mm -hmm. you know, impress people or so that you take somebody down a peg. But there are really virtuous reasons to do reviews, you know, because you care enough, the work is important enough to spend time on it, you know, to help move the craft ahead, you know, um, to be part of the dialogue about writing, you know. I, you know, so I just asked her that, you know, what if the only people who were going to read it were people who really loved you and really understood what you were trying to accomplish? Then what would you say? And, and, and of course, I know that the people who, you know, ultimately would read it aren't all people who love this person and, you know, won't regard. Here's what I want. What would you say in a world where you just let yourself speak? Mm-hmm. It's much easier for us to get that with other people than it is with ourselves. Mm-hmm. Self, you know, it's tough. We hear every flaw, every potential flaw. You know, I, whenever I do a workshop, I always think, I mean, the one you went to. Mm-hmm. Afterwards, I think, oh, I didn't cover this. Or, <laughs> it was pretty <laughs> awful. <laughs> not that I've never taken workshop because I, I have i have tanked a workshop before um if it's not okay to fall down then you don't get to play and so you know if you can't accept falling down then you don't get to play it's like when you go to yoga you know um, my uh, favorite yoga teacher stevie self always says that falling is part of the posture uh-huh, yes <laughs> you're falling is part of the posture you know and uh, she talks about like can you sort of like and really you know like the way i've kind of internalized that is like you know when i find myself falling to like sort of imagine like okay if falling were part of this posture then what would that look yeah, like right. <laughs> yes i'll bring that to your class tomorrow <laughs> so there's the kind of fall out and you know stevie always talks about you know can you sort of allow a certain kind of grace you know a certain humanity in the fall and the return, you know, to the post from the fall. Well, like that's something you can practice, not just at yoga, but anywhere. You know, can you fall? And like, like what if falling and like doing workshops or teaching where falling means giving a really lousy lecture or unkindly or something. That's what falling means. And so falling is part of the pose well, what would that look like, you know? And it would look like, you know, you'd try to fall as gently as possible as soon as you noticed it, you know, and you'd try to kind of catch yourself. And then you'd try to return, you know, to what it is you were engaged in. Something like that. That seems like a an act of, um, you know, and a question I like to ask people all the time is I, I like to ask people, Think of someone who you really, really love, like without reservation, with all your heart. Maybe you can kind of picture their face, you know, see them. Someone who you just love. And then I like to ask people, imagine that you were someone you loved like that. Oh. I know it's hard to imagine. You were someone who you loved like that. You know, and then... You know, to ask yourself, is this what I would offer to someone who I love like that? And so, like, would you let them fall down, make mistakes? You know, would you hate them when they made mistakes? You know, would you would you help them back up? You know, sure. You know, would you give them a chance to fall? You wouldn't tie them up and send them from ever falling. Tie them to a chair. They'll never fall. (laughs) See, that's what people do. 
to themselves. They tie themselves to a chair. It keeps them from ever falling, but it also keeps them from ever getting up. <laughs> this is about offering yourself you know, enough love and kindness that you let yourself fall and catch yourself as soon as you can, help yourself back up, give yourself another chance. You know, you think about that person you really, really love. Would you give them another chance? Sure you would. How about you? Would you give you another chance? Come on. <laughs> Come on. I think about that. It's hard. I know. You know we've sort of used our, our time uh, today. I hope that we've used it well. And uh, really for you to give me a chance to talk. I'm a little self-conscious because I know I talk really, really a lot. That was really, really what I wanted you to. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm very um, self-conscious that I didn't say a lot because I was struggling with my language. So <laughs> here we are, two people struggling. <laughs> yeah. I hope that, um, you know, people who listen to this will find something in it that is helpful to them, you know, that moves them forward. So. Thank you very much, Kelly, this journey. My pleasure. You have listened to an episode of Common Humanity Podcast, brought to you by psychologist and theologian Dorte Lunasco. To learn more about Kelly Wilson, please follow the link in the description of this episode. You are more than welcome to share this podcast.